This video is on how to manage COVID-19 at home using the top 10 supplements and a very practical integrative approach. So the real trick here is to start at the first sign of illness. Get a test, but do not wait for a test before starting a treatment regime. Now, symptoms can be anything from chills, fever, muscle aches, loss of smell or taste, cough or shortness of breath, sore throat, congestion, headaches, diarrhea. So really pay attention for anything that might seem a little bit out of the ordinary. Now, by way of introduction, my name is Gina Serioko. I am dually board certified in internal medicine and integrative medicine, meeting you here at the intersection of the two. Now, what would I do? These decisions are based off of published evidence, what's available so far, my clinical evidence working at the Respiratory Care Clinic, the COVID Results Task Force, and my own primary care outpatient clinic, where I've treated hundreds of patients with COVID, and also just basic science. The very first thing to keep in mind at the first sign of symptoms is to quarantine for a full 10 days if infected. This is to protect your family and the community. Here's a study that just came out last week from the Journal of the American Medical Association, Household Transmission of sars cov 2 Virus. They say in this meta-analysis of 54 studies with over 77,000 patients, the estimated overall household secondary attack rate was 16.6%. Now, if you're like me, you're kind of shocked at how low that number is, but this is really great news. This means that if you quarantine at the very first sign of symptoms, hide in your room, try not to come out, there's a very, very good chance that you can keep your family safe. Now, what about fatality rates? This is new data from the European Journal of Epidemiology just two weeks ago. They say the estimated age-specific infection fatality rate is very low for children and younger adults, but increases progressively from 0.4% at age 55 1.4% at age 65, 4.6% at age 75, and a whopping 15% at 85. Now, fatality rates are gonna to continue to go down as we have better medicines in the hospital, but I'm hoping this regimen will keep you out of the hospital in the first place. And there's some data to show that that may be true and certainly true from my own personal experience. Now, as an outpatient doctor, I'm actually really worried about this issue, which is the long haulers. So Harvard published a letter in October, the tragedy of the post-COVID long haulers. Now, what is this? This is when you have lingering symptoms for two, three, four months after COVID, even after just a mild or moderate case. So these lingering symptoms can be things like just a little shortness of breath, brain fog and headaches, chronic fatigue. So 50 to 30% of mild to moderate cases, people who didn't even need to go to the ER are presenting with these lingering symptoms and the numbers are much higher if you were actually hospitalized. So my question is, can we possibly prevent this by support, supporting the immune system during the infection? And while we're waiting for more research, why not try? So at the first sign of illness. So first of all, in my very first webinar, and I'll put a link to that at the bottom called Optimizing Your Immune System Against COVID-19, I go through all the data on diet and lifestyle and the research specifically in COVID-19, as well as in viral infections in general. So I encourage you to look at that for lifestyle information and the research behind it. I would choose green tea. Green tea has EGCG, which in research and molecular docking studies, there's actually a possibility that it can be anti-COVID itself. Electrolytes and coconut water. So patients who are hospitalized with COVID tend to be very deficient in potassium. So why not just get a jump on that early on? Get plenty of rest, eat farm and garden food, and of course, let's talk about supplements. So supplements are not anti-COVID. Your own immune system is anti-COVID. Supplements support your immune system. Now, please note, the recommendations I'm talking about today are considered generally safe for healthy individuals, but please consult with a knowledgeable practitioner before making changes to your healthcare regimen, especially if you have a history of kidney or liver disease or on multiple medications. So let's start with my first top three. Now, as a side note, there's probably an extra 
10 to 20 supplements I could be talking about today, but I'm choosing this specific protocol for multiple reasons. Number one, what data is available in COVID-19 specifically and these supplements. Number two, things that are accessible at the local pharmacy or local health food store. And number three, economy value, and also what you probably have hopefully uh, in the house already. So that's, what, that's how I came up with this regimen. So my first top three priority, number one, vitamin D. Take a look at the dosage here. This is a high dose bolus, 10,000 units, which is 250 micrograms. You wanna take that with your biggest meal for five days in a row. This has probably the strongest research in COVID, and there are multiple studies that I go through in my second webinar called Best Evidence-Based Supplements for Cold Flu COVID-19 Season. I'll put that down in the links below. So in that webinar, I go through all the research. There are at least five studies showing that vitamin D at high doses at the first sign of illness can markedly decrease COVID-19 severity and even mortality. Some studies say up to 50%. So high dose with dinner for five days is pretty much impossible to overdose if you keep it to five days. Number two, zinc, 75 milligrams in divided dosages. Now you may have zinc lozenges at home. I want you to pull them out and look at the back of the bottle or the back of the package. How many milligrams is each lozenge? You probably have to take many of them throughout the day to get up to 75 milligrams. And this is the dose that was reviewed in the Cochrane Review as what you would take to be effective to decrease viral infections. So, um, an oral is probably fine as well, but most of the research is done on a lozenge. This is best done on an empty stomach one hour before or two hours after eating, but if it bothers your stomach, go ahead and just take it with food. I do include a little bit more information in an Instagram post I recently did. Now, the third top priority is vitamin C. 2,000 milligrams every six hours. And yes, this is a high dose. Vitamin D is a very potent antioxidant. Oh, excuse me, vitamin C is a very potent antioxidant. It's kind of like water to a fire. If you have a little campfire, you only need a little water. If you got an explosive COVID campfire or an explosive COVID forest fire, you need a lot more water. So that's why I recommend the high dose vitamin C. Now, the very reputable Cleveland Clinic is currently doing a research trial giving patients oral zinc plus 8,000 milligrams of vitamin C per day at the first sign of COVID. So there is enough research to suggest this is possible and we're waiting for those results to come out in the spring, but there's enough research for me to wanna to start doing this now. The worst thing that can happen with too much vitamin C for short bursts is loose stool. So if that happens, go ahead and cut back on the dose to a thousand milligrams, but keep up the every six hour dosing. The dosing really is proportional to the extent of the symptoms that you have. So that's my top three. Additional support that you may add on, a basic multivitamin. So we know that B complexes and selenium and other minerals are important in supporting your immune system. Omega-3 fish oil, 3000 milligrams, high dose. So if you have fish oil at home, take it out, look at the back of the bottle and look specifically for the number next to EPA and DHA. You want that combination to be over 3000 milligrams a day during illness. So omega-3s are the backbone of a part of the immune system called SPMs, special pro-resolving mediators. I like to call it the calm down and cleanup crew of the immune system. And in COVID, this is particularly important. Patients who end up in the hospital are having a hard time calming down and cleaning up the infection. Melatonin, which might be a surprise to you. So melatonin is marketed as a sleeping hormone, which it is, but it's actually a very powerful immune modulator. It helps to amplify the initial attack part of your immune system, the natural killer cells, the macrophages, your T helper cells. But importantly, it helps to dampen the parts of the immune system that tend to go haywire in COVID, the NF-kappa B and the NLRP3 inflammasomes. So the dosage is gonna depend on what you can tolerate anywhere from one to 10 milligrams a night during illness. The main side effect here is vivid dreams. So if you wake up with crazy dreams, then just cut down on the dose. 
NAC, N-acetylcysteine, 900 milligrams every eight hours during illness. So NAC may be a little trickier to find. It's the precursor to the master antioxidant of the body called glutathione. Glutathione helps to neutralize a lot of the inflammation in the body, and there's good research on this in influenza and also in hospitalized patients. As a bonus, NAC also is liver protective. So if you're taking Tylenol for your fevers or your aches, the NAC can also help to protect your liver. Additional support. Now, these aren't exactly supplements. They're over-the-counter medications, but bridging Western and integrative medicine, I needed to mention them. So aspirin, 325 milligrams a day. One of the crazy things about COVID is that it can make the blood very sticky. It can cause strokes and blood clots, and we see this all the time in the hospital. In fact, when a patient is hospitalized with COVID, we put them on blood thinners. So let's not wait. If it's safe for you to do so, go ahead and add on an aspirin a day. Now, famotidine and antihistamines. So famotidine is marketed as a pill for heartburn, but it's also something called an H2 blocker, a histamine blocker. And antihistamines, of course, Zyrtec, Claritin, Allegra, these are histamine blockers. Why is this important? Well, we seem to notice that the patients who are hospitalized, who just happen to be on these medications before ending up in the hospital, tend to do better and have better survival rates. We think this is because antihistamines dampen the mast cell in the immune system. These are the histamine releasers, which cause a lot of inflammation. So there you go. That was pretty much a whirlwind. This is my brief summary here. Now you know what I know. Now you know what I would do, and this is a very practical regimen to consider. And if you're not having symptoms now and just planning ahead, this is your shopping list. So may you stay strong and heal fully. Remember that the odds are incredibly in your favor, and we're just hoping to tip them even more in your favor with some of these steps. Of course, if you have escalating symptoms, seek medical help or head to the emergency room. Now it's your turn. Sharing is caring. I'm sure you know someone who knows, needs to know this information. You can subscribe to keep ahead of future updates. And otherwise, I'll see you on Instagram.